According to security video footage, Annie Lee was seen entering the Amistad building shortly after 10 a.m. that day. By 9 p.m., her housemates contacted authorities when she did not return home. Despite several attempts to contact her, she did not respond. Upon reviewing the security recordings, the police discovered that she had not left the Amistad building. Her phone, keys, wallet, and other personal items were all left in her office. With her wedding quickly approaching, some suspected that she might have been experiencing pre-wedding nerves. However, her disappearance was taken seriously. The police promptly shut down the entire Amistad building for investigation. They conducted thorough searches, even checking the Hartford dump where Yale's waste is incinerated. Every possible lead was pursued. The FBI and Connecticut State Police soon joined the New Haven Police Department in the search efforts. It wasn't until her wedding day that her family received some answers. Authorities discovered blood-stained clothing hidden above a ceiling tile in the building, which is monitored by over 70 security cameras. It was evident that she had been in the building, and they were aware that they were looking for a person who had access, as entry to the building and its rooms required Yale identification cards. While searching for Annie, investigators also delved into potential motives for wanting to cause her harm. They located her before uncovering the reasons behind the incident. To this day, the true motive remains unknown. Yale President Richard Levin informed university staff and students in a letter that a female body was discovered in the Amistad building's basement. The woman's identity was confirmed to be Annie Lee, and law enforcement continues to investigate actively in the hopes of a swift resolution. Unspecified sources revealed that on her wedding day, at 5 p.m., the woman's decomposing body was detected by police cadaver dogs concealed within a wall in a lab room. This room, previously used for animal experiments and research, had been the grisly location of her remains being forced into a cramped space, her bones fractured to ensure a fit. Subsequent examination unveiled that her demise was attributed to traumatic asphyxia due to neck compression, with evidence of pre-death injuries including a broken jaw and collarbone. The somber discovery also revealed partial undress upon her, along with traces of semen on her body and undergarments. The inquiry into whether this incident resulted from a botched sexual assault led investigators to focus on Raymond Clark a 24-year-old lab technician with building access and a reason to enter that specific lab. On September 16th, subsequent to obtaining a warrant for his DNA, Clark was apprehended the following day once his genetic material matched the semen discovered on the victim's body. Why did he commit the crime? No motive was ever disclosed by him, but those familiar with him mentioned his tendency to get upset with students who he felt left the lab in a messy state after finishing their work. One of those students was Annie Lee, who had received complaints from Clark in an email about leaving dirty mice cages behind following one of her studies. However, if his motivation was solely based on anger towards the untidiness she left, does that justify his actions? A former friend described Clark as he was a pretty nice kid, very good with people who were older. He respected authority. Another schoolmate, Kelly Godfrey, who had conversed with him within the past year, attested to his character. Ray was just the nicest kid. He wasn't judgmental. He was really quiet, but he was very friendly. He was easily one of the nicest guys in our class. This is a real shock. However, insights into another aspect of his character were provided by Anna Marie Goodwin, a neighbor who highlighted his conduct towards his girlfriend, Jennifer Romadga, with whom he also worked at the Yale lab. She mentioned, he was very controlling of his girlfriend. He wouldn't let her talk to me or anyone. Initially maintaining his innocence, Clark eventually changed his plea in March 2011. Without providing a reason for the murder, he entered a guilty plea in return for a 44-year prison sentence. Concerning the charge of attempted sexual assault, he submitted an Alford plea, an admission of the evidence's sufficiency without admitting guilt. He received his formal sentencing on June 3, 2011, where he expressed regret for his actions. However, he provided no explanation for the crime. Currently, he is serving his term at the Cheshire Correctional Institution, 
and is set for release on September 16, 2053. Annie Lee was adored by many, with memorials held in both California and New York. Her funeral was streamed live on the Internet. According to the Yale Daily News, Professor John Lewis Gaddis referred to September 14 as the saddest day to start class since the day after the 9-11 attacks.